you probably know this, cellular technology with bonding. Uh, we use LiveView mostly for TV and the Quantum Excel for radio. And I'm assuming that in the future, there will be or actually near future, even now, I think there will be more integrated solutions, uh, probably that will be better for uh, for most usability, I guess. And, and then of course, uh, in terms of size, uh, integrated solutions, also getting rid of the SIM cards, the SIMs, that's at least what we're hoping for. So, but there is a thing with technology. I mean, that's that's only part of it. The bigger thing is cultural um, challenges that we find in our organizations. That basically has to do with the, the fact that we don't we don't feel really confident with the type of remote production uh, technologies that we now are trying uh, with solar technology. Uh, but I believe that in in time it will be uh, mature enough to to go for the big productions. So, so this is what we can imagine in the future and in the near future, I hope. Um, and the, the main thing here is, of course, uh, flexibility. Um, in, and in, in our remote productions, uh, we actually use fiber. Uh, and that's a less uh, flexible option, I would say. <laughs> uh, you can imagine if you want to add a camera or change a camera in this setting uh, and moving the cables through the slopes in the crowd, and it's, it's actually impossible. So um, another thing that comes with also the compressed formats that we use when we go wireless uh, and over IP, of course, uh, it's basically possible to uh, include this in the cloud-based uh, workflows. And as you probably know, that will increase efficiency uh, in the workflow uh, because we can actually work in parallel on the same content and using the same tools. Uh, so um, in our trials, uh, we have actually used uh, several control rooms uh, and working in, in parallel. So uh, the main thing with Fudge 5G, I think for us was that we were able to cooperate with the Norwegian Defense and also an operator, uh, Telenor, uh, helping us with the equipment being already available to us so we could just borrow it basically. This is expensive stuff, uh, but it's really high end. Um, it's a 64 times 64 of a massive MIMO antenna uh, with beam forming and uh, yeah, it's, it's probably the, the best of breed uh, from Huawei at the time that we started. And now it's constantly being upgraded with other equipment as well and other frequencies and trying out different things also for the Norwegian defense use cases. Uh, and we are able to test that as well with higher bit rates and higher bandwidth, of course. Um, but uh, in general, uh, I think that the main uh, goal for us uh, with these trials was actually to establish some type of cooperation um, across divisions that usually doesn't cooperate. Uh, that was even within NRK, so the technology people working closer with uh, the people in production. Um, and uh, the first trial was basically just to see if we could make this work uh, in a multi-cam setup. That, that's not so interesting <laughs> to look at, I guess, if we're, because we're actually just filming a, in a parking lot outside of the, um, the army camp. Uh, but the trials uh, use case is interesting, I think, because that can be of general value to many. Uh, what we're trying to achieve is actually a robust remote production. So what you can see within the red square here is uh, actually a, a private 5G uh, island, you might call it, standalone non-public network. Uh, that is independent on the backhaul. So even if the connection to the operator or actually the connection to the internet in this case uh, falls down, you're still able to produce within this square. So um, let's, uh, for example, consider that you are a host broadcaster and you're, you can't really uh, miss out on the action. So you, you need to be able to continue producing and also to deliver the main program out. In this case, you can you can live with a, a, just a backup feed on bonding uh, public uh, cellular networks, uh, even with satellite, just to get the main program out. And then if you get the connection back again with the internet, then of course you can have the more sophisticated workflows with access to the ISO feeds and everything. And uh, also previews, of course, so you can control it in the field or remotely. So this is the setup. I'm not going through it, but we did test with several types of cameras, PTC, set the uh, portable, um, more uh, heavy, uh, high-end cameras as well. Um, and we didn't quite achieve this goal, though. We were hoping to get latency below, below 40 milliseconds. Uh, but uh, our learning has been that we can, we can live with higher latency for most productions. 
so realistically, we were doing about 120 to 130 milliseconds and 160 milliseconds, even if we add, add the cloud uh, setup that we have later in a later trial. Uh, for uh, audio, uh, this is uh, slides basically from uh, Sennheiser, but uh, we were very far <laughs> away from this goal. Um, doing monitoring, in-air monitoring, and these kind of things we didn't even look into because we knew we, we wasn't able to solve it with the technology that we had currently. Less than four milliseconds to avoid getting confused from hearing your own voice delay. That's, that's, that was impossible to achieve. But I guess it is later possible to achieve maybe with some type of edge computing. And yeah, there are other experts working on this side. So uh, to look more into what we actually did, um, the, um, uh, setup that we had uh, was basically based on uh, video xlink um, that is a, it's actually a proprietary protocol that we're using but it does have support for srt as well but we ended up using the, the xlink protocol because it wasn't so uh, vulnerable to to deadlocks basically it wasn't waiting for the the return or the ACK, so it was actually just pushing data no matter what and uh, the latency was also quite good on that um and uh, in general i would say this is, this is a functional thing for us also because we have um a data trunk here that we can do the controlling of the cameras through um so it worked for us and of course in the future i guess ndi uh, could also work uh, at the time the ndi 5 part uh, was not properly released so it was only uh, able to run on local area networks we did try with the ndi bridge at a very early version uh, to see if we could make our udp work uh, that's that's the part that claims that you could get ndi to work on the internet uh, more robust way of retransmitting packets i guess but uh, that was uh, too early to test. So we haven't been able to properly work on those things. But uh, there are other things also with NDI 5 that we find interesting. And that is uh, for the really low end productions, if we are able to utilize, uh, let's say, the native ARM support that you have there as well for mobile devices to, to have you know, uh, vision mixers within uh, mobile devices. And you can really, really have a lightweight multiple camera setup. <laughs> Okay, uh, looking at the other end, the high end, uh, we uh, hope to do this at a later stage, probably with the cooperation with many of you uh, present today. Uh, for 2110 and uh, PTP, I think it's very challenging to, to find a solution for the very strict uh, requirements when it comes to precision. I don't know if the 5G networks that we are currently working on is precise enough to, to handle, handle this with the digital that we have measured. Uh, and I'm assuming there are also some things when it comes to PTP missing actually in the release 15, at least of the standard. Uh, it's probably coming in 16 or 17. Uh, well, it's starting in 16, I've, I've heard. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe this is something to look at uh, in the summer when you do the next trial. Okay, um, we did also look into using the public uh, 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 cellular uh, services, uh, but uh, not uh, the ones that are available to us yet, just in a basically scientific uh, approach. Uh, in a science science network that was provided to us by Telnor, we could demonstrate that we, we were able to do prioritized traffic uh, to our MCR. So this is the use of slice, of course, in a 5G standalone network. Uh, yeah, uh, we can go back to the, the actual case for the trials um, this is what we hope to of course achieve is basically a high quality uh, data link quality uh, in the, in a you know an area where you have many people sharing the same resources basically that is the most challenging uh, now for our uh, settler setups but of course if if we are using uh, even though we are using live view things like you know, uh, quantum Excel doing cellular bonding. Uh, it doesn't really help that much <laughs> if all the uh, radio capacity is gone for reasons of natural disaster or terror in this case. So um, we need we need to be able to bring basically coverage on demand to be able to 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 make these you know uh, private five G networks uh, work in the area where we need to cover things over a longer period of time. This goes for both sports and news. But it's a very common case, I guess, that we end up going to the same place as all the others, uh, other media people, when they have the same live views and it's all, you know, uh, no capacity in total. 
So um, the use case that we were actually working mostly on with the private uh, non-public network standalone is very similar to what the Norwegian Defense was actually doing. So they um, they were dependent on the robust part of it, basically, where you can uh, rely on these kind of technologies even in the battlefield. In this case, they're trying to figure out where the uh, bullet comes from if someone is shooting uh, towards your soldiers. And uh, just by measuring the time of arrival of the audio uh, in the devices that the soldiers are carrying, uh, they can do uh, triangulation and figure out where it comes from. They can also do some AI, uh, it's actually edge computing, uh, on uh, the cell on wheel, uh, the cow. And uh, yeah, they use the Snowball Edge uh, computer, very heavy thing in, inside there, uh, to, to figure out whether this was a friendly bullet or not. Um, yeah quite complicated stuff, more complicated than what we did anyhow. But it's nice that they were able to, to give us the equipment to test. Um, they also had another trial that we, we joined. Um, this was with drones uh, together with the, the emergency defenses, uh, sorry, the emergency units. Uh, they were testing uh, whether they could give more uh, situational awareness uh, with uh, drones hanging over an area that they were trying to cover. Uh, uh, and uh, in this case, we could use, of course, the video feeds uh, for uh, news coverage, but we could also uh, ask the same, uh, with the same need as the emergency units, basically uh, utilize the, the fact that you have maps uh, showing what's in the area. Uh, and of course, uh, there was also IR, um, infrared uh, uh, stuff that could check if there was people allow, uh, alive based on their uh, temperatures and uh, yeah these these kind of technologies are evolving and i think yeah, they will come also in a form that will be autonomous so it will actually fly by itself in corridors that they are allowed maybe even arriving uh, at the site before uh, the emergency units do so uh, in general this is the 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 gang <laughs> that we've been cooperating with, uh, Norwegian Defense, and actually Triple M has provided a lot of the production equipment here, and they are trying to, with connected venues, develop it further and make it even more challenging that tri than the trial we uh, that we originally started with. Um, and I just want to say that we are very thankful to the guys uh, working uh, in the 5G Vini and Fudge 5G in general, of course, uh, who are providing these networks for testing. Um, so uh, this is the team. Uh, and the first uh, trial that we did with real production was um, basically um, a jump, ski jump production where we had a total of 11 cameras and three of them were wireless. Um, the uh, setup was basically uh, aimed at trying IP in general. So the 5G part was just piggybacked on another production. But it was very useful to see uh, that the difference between the wireless and the wired cameras wasn't really that noticeable for anyone in the production. And here we also used video X-Link. Um, and uh, to add on to the complexity, I guess, uh, and to try the bit more challenging things that we needed to learn from, uh, Triple M uh, tested uh, the, the vision mixer in the cloud, AWS. Uh, it was in Stockholm, uh, an instance in Stockholm, and it was quite near, of course, then to Video X Link's headquarters. So this is actually uh, to the cloud transported as a full uh, NDI data trunk. Uh, from from the headquarters to the the, the cloud, um, basically, but of course on the internet uh, and the production elsewhere, it's it's actually the use of the protocol X link in this case. So with um, yeah UDP retransmission, and it worked fine. Uh, I think that it was really a success. Uh, we learned a lot from it. Uh, I think we're. We were sort of uh, convinced that this is something we could actually use for production. So uh, it helped also uh, on the investments at NRK that we are we are actually now purchasing equipment that is planned to be used for for real productions, not not just trial productions. This and this production actually went on air, and that's also kind of fascinating <laughs> on NRK one. <laughs> Okay, uh, another production that didn't go on air, but that was even more challenging. That was uh, the last trial that we did. And that was basically trying to uh, see if we could do a full 5G production where everything was wireless. 
And uh, thank God it was wireless because in this case, uh, we really need the flexibility of uh, wireless links. Because on the way up there, we realized that we were only gonna get half of the accreditations. So uh, the people who were in the 5G cow, the cell on wheels, um, they didn't get access to the area of production, which means we had to move the 5G cow uh, 300 meters outside of the actual production area. And that, that went just fine. Uh, it wasn't a problem at all because it's wireless, basically. Um, but uh, another thing we realized was that we were all, all also dependent on another uh, flexibility. And that was the fact that we had moved to IP because the backhaul was on a fiber. And when we moved it, um, or actually after we had moved the cow and we figured in the morning we were ready to do the production, uh, then it was uh, the cable was run over by some preparation equipment, some some type of vehicle, and then uh, we just figured, okay, this won't work. We can't do the production, but we actually managed to do so because we could connect uh, the cable uh, to uh, a cafeteria nearby <laughs> on standard internet, basically. But it was, you know, with a good enough capacity to actually get the signals home to NRK, and I think that proves for, you know, the real need for flexibility in production as well. So, uh, of course, we work with prototypes, and uh, that has a downside. Sometimes things don't really work as expected, but I think in general it did in this case. So there was only one of the CPEs that, that froze due to the temperatures that's below, I think, uh, 20 minus. So, um, yeah, I think all in all, it worked really fine, uh, and we have learned a lot from it. I'm hoping that we can, can join uh, on the effort with more of you guys here uh, to figure out how we can do synchronization in a proper way, because that we haven't looked into. And I'm hoping for PTP to work in a future um, trial with these guys again. Cheers. <laughs>